Alright folks, welcome back to another Besides Our Own podcast. I'm Stephen, we have Craig on the other side of the table. How are you doing Craig, you good? Yeah, I'm doing fine, I Don't care. On the line right now, <laughs> we have our good friend, Neil Hanvey. How are you doing, Neil? I'm good, guys. How's you, how are you doing yourselves? Uh, we're doing fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I was shut down before the, com- the conversation even started. I always there. have to just annoy you before we start. That's, uh, that's the way we start these <laughs> things. Right, cool. So we've got uh, Neil Hanvey on. Originally, it wasn't pr- pretty much part of our plan at the beginning for these yes, podcasts. Yes, we had no idea we would have Neil on at any point. Like right uh, at the beginning. So when we when we initially started this, I think your second and third interviews we've done. Uh, we've already done thirteen interviews. Mm-hmm. So I think the second and third interview we done were with AFI and ISP, yeah, uh, who no longer exist because of the party that Neil's in. So Neil <laughs> has essentially made two of our interviews. We were, we were in the middle of one interview just as Ava was being announced. Yeah. yeah. So that was interesting, that one. So we just like cut it off and we're like, listen, if you disband, then the, so, the interview goes nowhere but... Like, so basically we could blame Neil for two interviews not being used. Basically, aye. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, it's, um, it's sad that, that uh, the, all the efforts... Um, Folk put into both of those parties uh, and the um, work that they did uh, was kind of scuppered uh, at the last minute, so to speak. But I think it's been really valuable in that it's it, it did provide that conversation that many many people had about how do you match the yes vote, how do you influence the election to lock out the, to- the Tory party in particular from the Scottish Parliament, and so uh, whilst they uh, are not going on forward into the competition. We do know that um, you know the support for them wasn't possibly wasn't high enough. A bit like rise. We're not exactly charging ahead at the moment, but we've certainly got decent numbers. Um, so hopefully, uh, all of their efforts in starting that conversation will actually be um, you know a, a key part of the drive towards uh, both folks. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know it was a, an issue. During, like before Alba came into this, that uh, the split the vote thing was still an argument because there were three parties on the list uh, arguing for list votes. And of course there's the argument with the Greens standing in constituencies against the SNP, so that split uh, argument still exists. But at least now there's no more argument about splits in the list vote because two parties agree to stand down in order to let another party through. So it's kind of it's much harder to make that argument now. I think it is. I, I think you know. I would take it back a step, guys. Um, I remember you know the the Tuesday after we lost the independence referendum, and we'd all had a, a week of drowning our sorrows. So I certainly did. Um, you know, the sense of devastation uh, from over that weekend was just you know horrendous, um, and it was that initial trickle of new members into the SNP and then that became a you know a, a, a heavy stream of folk and more and more and more um, and by the Tuesday we were all kind of excited and I got um, the, the gang the campaign gang and the Dunfermline area back together and we went to the pub where we had all our, our regular socials and um, planning meetings and um, uh, I spoke at that and um really galvanised everyone towards um, making a real push for independence. And I think we all wanted at that time for there to be an all-party and none-party, if you like, an alliance that would stand on the list uh, and none of the other parties would contest the list. So it would be a really a proper, clear run. Um, and I think a lot of people were a bit vexed and uh, hacked off that the SNP you know, and I was part of that, decided that, no, no, we're going to take control of the whole the whole thing. We're the most viable party. We're the ones that are going to have the, the strongest vote. Well, that has had that strongest vote quite a few times now. And, you know, I've been part of that push, part of those campaigns. And for us still to be tepid about, or for us, well, I, see, I still can't get the language out of my mouth. Um, for the SNP to still be tepid about independence, to be kicking the can to 2023 
when the Conservatives are trying to take away uh, the approved legislation of the Scottish Parliament and sending it to the Supreme Court. I, I, that we can't wait. We, we need to do something now. Yeah, so so that's interesting that this was uh, going on even back in 2014. I, I was never aware yeah. of that because uh, Solidarity sort of pushed this idea in 2015 or, well, for the 2016 yeah. Parliament elections and uh, I wasn't in Solidarity at the time and they were just roasted for this stupid idea <laughs> of uh, splitting the vote and not voting SNP too and a uh, it made sense to me. I wasn't. I didn't join uh, Solidarity until after the election, but it made sense to me. And uh, the fact that even within the SNP, this was a discussion in, in 2014 is is quite interesting. Yeah, I mean the uh, the both folks SNP. I think with a fair wind and a whole lot of luck, you might get the a return of the 2011 result. You know, you might, but there's so many small variables can make such a massive difference. It's not really a safe, I don't think, a safe strategy. And by having uh, a both votes yes strategy um, and working for cooperation, I mean, if you look at, at the Greens, they're contesting 14 constituencies. We're not, we're not a threat to the SNP at all. Not at all. We're not competing for uh, any of the constituencies that we hope they will win. What we are aiming for is a maximum number of list votes that will give the Scottish people a proper voice where every debate will not be framed by the constitutional um, uh, fear-mongering of the Unionist parties. And we can start to talk about what Scotland could be. And we can start to make policy about what Scotland wants to be. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the, the prize that I can see no flaw in at all. Mm. Can I ask? Um, that's probably one of the bigger questions that people would be wondering at this moment. Um, like, how long before uh, Arbor was announced? Like, did you know about this? Um, I, I, I literally found out just before it. Um, I, I guess. Um, so when I went back into the SNP in May of 2020, um, and I was part of the group, I was kind of, you know. Hugely relieved, full of enthusiasm, desperate to crack on, to get involved in, you know, how we were going to argue for independence, what our lines of attack would be, how we would manage and use the Westminster system to highlight our um, position. And, you know, I was disappointed that what we were doing was playing the Westminster game, um, you know, uh, thinking up clever talking points rather than, um, you know, um, meeting their rhetoric with our rhetoric. And, you know, whatever you say about Boris Johnson, he connects with the people that are his base um, in the way that he presents himself, how awful that may be. And I'm not suggesting that we adopt a similar stance, but we certainly should have the same energy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it started to get frustrating. The um, attitude uh, that I experienced of um, people towards me was pretty difficult. Um, you know, watching uh, female colleagues, uh, you know, be uh, <laughs> bullied, uh, and and uh, you know, I can't think of any other word, uh, and um, and being unable to express themselves, bursting into tears in meetings, um, because of the hostility, and um, after the Salmond inquiry, there was a. Uh, and almost the, the rhetoric was really upsetting. Um, and I, I expressed my concern about that to, to Kenny privately over WhatsApp. And I said, you know, basically said, oh, this is depressing. How on earth are we going to... I, I really wanted to try and fix things from the inside, if you like, try and work constructively um, so that some of the hostility in the party was maybe dealt with. Um, and it was clear that that was, you know, that was just not going to happen. So uh, Kenny spoke to me, and Kenny knew about it. I don't. You'd have to ask him when he knew about it. But I found out the Wednesday before. So I found out after that group meeting. I just, I just was sickened um, by uh, what, what I just sat through. 
um, and uh, he he told me about Alba, and I, I was there in a heartbeat. Really, I had I had to consult with my team. It was a big decision, and I did think about it, and I did take everything they said into consideration. But for me, Scotland comes first, and the future of Scotland for my children and for everybody else comes first. And um, I think this is the right thing to do. It's a bold thing to do. Um, and come what may, I have absolutely no regrets about the decision I've taken. I, I was I was really confused because this is not no disrespect to Stephanie, but uh, I was reading through the candidates list for Mid Scotland and Fife, and uh, I was reading the biography for Stephanie, and she was talking about how she's like a, a chef in Falkirk, and I'm like, how how has this happened? Like, so we, we had a, in solidarity, we had an NEC meeting on the Sunday before Arbor was announced. And we yeah. had assumptions of what was about to happen. We guessed, we had a bunch of different theories of what might or might not be happening during the week. Uh, we initially thought Wednesday is when it was going to be announced. And then it ended up happening on Friday. But we had... No real idea. We had, as I say, we had guesses, but we had no real idea. And then it comes out, and there's a chef from Falkirk that's involved <laughs> in this big hidden political party process. And I'm like, how has that happened? There, there must have been a lot of hidden meetings and secret things going on for months. Uh, there, there, there must have been, but I was, I was with their guys, so I can't give you the the lowdown on that. I'm afraid. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, I really did. I, it was. I think just because I mean Kenny and I had spoken many times about our frustration, um, both with the direction of the party, the direction of the group, and you know what could be done about it, and we earnestly tried to work with others to try and influence, uh, you know, the the NEC elections, trying to get sensible people on there, and then you know that was undermined, and I think everybody just had, had enough. I had certainly had enough. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I can't uh, abide some of the behaviour that I've experienced. Mm-hmm. There you go. There you go. I'll stop tomorrow. We, we, we totally jumped in, in, the, in the middle there. So we should start at the, at the start. Right. So, uh, so I, I wanted to talk about, about your childhood. So did, like, where did you grow up, Neil? Oh. Hey, um, right. Well, I was uh, originally born in Belfast um, right. and we lived. In, in two places there. We lived in uh, Monkstown, which is uh, just outside Newton Abbey, um, not far from Belfast. It's kind of, uh, if there's, there's a, such a thing as Greater Belfast, it's part of that. It's just on the shore road. You can see the Harlem Wolf yards from the bottom of the road where my grandparents stayed. So we stayed a bit in from there in, in Monk's place called Monkstown until I was probably about five. And then we lived in a place called Cumber. Uh, which is uh, near Newton Arts and Loch Ney uh, until I was seven years old. And then we, um, so we moved to Scotland when I was seven. We'd been over a few times. My dad's business had clients in Scotland and we'd been to Scotland on holiday. Um, and I absolutely loved it. We'd been to the tattoo a few times when I was wee, really wee. Uh, and, uh, it was um, so. It was really a welcome uh, move for me, and it, it's almost like it's a separate childhood. Really, I remember, um, you know, a very different world in in, in Ireland uh, with uh, the army and uh, police at every entrance and exit to shopping centres, and mm-hmm. um, you know, getting your Bag search, the car search, roadblocks, and um, all of this kind of stuff. You just, it was normal. Um, of course, it's, it's so abnormal, but um, uh, yeah, no, and I was kind of from a strange background. So, my father's father was an orangeman, and, um, and my mum's family were Episcopalians, which is kind of high church and take communion. So, mm. and, and that was, a, that was, it sounds ridiculous now, but that was a big deal then. And, um, you know, my grandfather was a really nice man generally, but he definitely was an orange man and, you know, all of the things that go with that, let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, 
you know, as I got older, I mean, my two best mates uh, in in Scotland, um, they were both Catholic lads, and I went to chapel with them, and I went to all the social events at chapel, and that was my kind of world. And my parents were totally cool about that, um, uh, uh, but. Uh, I kind of had to keep it secret from my grandfather, which you know, I just I still think it's utterly, utterly ridiculous. Yeah. Um. Mm. Uh, so I mean, that kind of framed my 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 early years. That um, the sort of sectarianism with a small s uh, about you know it, it, its influence just on the minutia of little details and the way people that you that you love your grandparents refer to your friends um, through a prism that you just don't comprehend and you just kind of think, well, that's a bit rude, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's strange, but it does help you um, understand some of that, uh, the, uh, I guess, indoctrinated opinions that people have because of um, whatever dogma, whether it's political dogma or religious dogma, but, you know, it's just dogma uh, that you have to believe to be one of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, do you find like even at that time like like um, sorry, I what I should get into? Sorry, so when you moved to Scotland, um, were you, have you um, like what? A... <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. Oh, Daniel, Jesus Christ! What got you into politics? Aye, aye. That's what I was trying, trying to frame it in the sense: is there anything you remember from your childhood that would have sorry like got you into politics at that point? Um. Well, certainly at the age of seven, not really. Um, uh, but I was always interested. I, I just had an affinity with politics. My mum was a trade unionist when she was younger. And um, so she was interested in politics. My, there was political discussion in the house when I was younger. Um, uh, and I think there was, a, you know, it was quite interesting watching my, my dad. My mum's my nickname when she was a wee girl was uh, We Red. Uh, that was what her father called her because she was... Uh, <laughs> She, she was the wee socialist, and you know, and good on her. That's all I can say. She was, you know, when she was a, 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 a really successful um, uh, trade unionist in the telephone exchange in Belfast, and she took on management there. And she was very capable. She knew and understood fundamental principles and rights. She was um, someone who took voting uh, as an absolute um, responsibility because of the women's movement and uh, the struggle for the vote and suffrage. So. You know, all of those kind of principles flowed from my mum. My dad's probably a little bit, he was a little less uh, political in, in that way, but he certainly shifted from the conservative, Northern Irish conservative um, views to um, SNP when I was in my teenage years. You know, they both shifted to the SNP uh, in Glenrothes because they felt that the, the, the councillors there were, better than anyone else and so that's who they, they voted for and and um so yeah that shift is quite natural mm-hmm. i think i said this to you once i think it was at a hustings that uh, most of the time at a hustings or at any sort of event where labor and the smp are it tends to be labor talking left and smp sort of introducing policies that are more left wing uh, in the end but in the case of the hustings I watched you at, you were also talking more left than the Labour guy. And I felt that that was quite an interesting change from sort of the normal way of how I've seen the hustings and events and things like that. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I would totally agree with that analysis. I think you're absolutely spot on because um, you know, the SNP uh, was, a, uh, was a broad church um, when I was uh, originally a member. I feel that that plurality of opinion, that acceptance of the broad church has been eroded over the last five years uh, to the extent that you, you're you not really permitted to think for yourself. Um, that's something that I think it's my mum's fault. Uh, you know, I, I won't <laughs> tolerate that. I can't, I can't do that. You know, that's, that's not politics for me. That's not debate. That's unacceptable. Um, and, you know, I think you're right. My opinions probably sit well to the left of the traditional SNP. I'm much more impatient about radical social policy change. I'm much more impatient about land reform. 
uh, I would like to see redistribution uh, uh, of wealth, not necessarily through heavy taxation of people who are well off, but by fair distribution of wealth to the population instead of it being siphoned off into large corporate hands. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably um, well to the left, but then, you know, I'm also uh, probably more to the middle uh, on some other issues. Um, but certainly on social policy, I think the only way to tackle deprivation, poverty, drug use, drug alcohol misuse, all of that kind of stuff is for people to have a sense of hope and that they belong, that they are worth, their, their lives are worthwhile, that they mean something, uh, that there's a hand there to support them if things do get tough. Um, you know, I, I think belittling people and making their lives feel hopeless, which is effectively what Westminster governments have done, um, whether they're red or blue, um, for all of my life, uh, I, I've seen an increase in poverty and deprivation. I just think it's totally and utterly unacceptable and unnecessary. That's the thing. Uh, and I never have ever understood greed. So, can I say, so what, what, was, what was your first foray into politics then? Um, well, I, I mean, I think probably um, the first kind of politic really is leadership. And so I had quite a few leadership roles in the NHS. Um, and I think leading people and having an opinion and being able to make um, judgments about how services and things should be delivered and developed and funded, mm-hmm. that that really gives you a, a, a broad understanding of the impact of policy decisions and of written lots of policy. So I think having, for me, to be an effective politician, um, it's much better to have had uh, some real-world experience, uh, wherever that is, and it doesn't have to be highfalutin, it doesn't have to be any, anything particularly special. But I think there's something intrinsically valuable about having lived uh, and having an understanding of the world of the people you're trying to represent. And I think that's one of the things that's missing from the labour movement um, and needs to be brought back is that the people who are in the labour movement are quite often, have, you know, not everyone, obviously, but have studied politics at university or have got a rich background and they come into politics because they're well-meaning. Whereas the labour movement really came from, you know, the, the, the shop floor and it was the... Um, those people who maybe could easily have gone to university, but because of the social circumstances of the time and the blocks, they didn't. But their intelligence and articulation and sense of right and wrong and morality was so clear because they had such sharp minds that they moved that, that debate into the, the, the centre and, and, and grew that movement. So I think that's probably one of the problems that the Labour movement has got generally is that it's, it's a bit too... Um, it's a bit highfalutin, you know, we need a bit more reality. But the tragedy is that there isn't that worker base to draw from. And most of the worker base is now in insecure employment. Uh, and so there isn't that cohesion to drive that labour movement. And that ultimately all comes down to the destruction of the uh, unionist, uh, the unions uh, by Thatcher, um, particularly through the, the, the minor strike. And, you know, all of this I, it was clearly an ideological drive to smash people's rights and representation. Uh, it's a long-term project and, you know, you can track it back uh, to, to, to the, um, the 70s and Thatcher. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if uh, she planned it as well as it worked out for her, but, I mean, the shift oh, no, and change no, from not. manufacturing to service and then the type of unionisation that happens within the service industry is so much less. Like, there's a way less unionised population within service industries like waitressing and, mm-hmm. uh, like, receptionists and working at uh, flight places and stuff like that. There's way less unionisation in those types of jobs than there is in manufacturing. And I don't know, mm. as I say, I don't know whether Margaret Thatcher planned this but that, in its in and of itself, sort of killed union uh, unionisation in the UK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was obviously a big objective of hers to smash Scargill's um, strike, you know, and to you know, she. Well, I could go I could go on on, on all day about how many um, dehumanising 
attacks she made on the British people, but um, we, I think that that has been explored by many others who are probably better qualified uh, than me to comment. But, um, you know, she is definitely a motivator for me in the terms that she is the antithesis of what I think uh, a, a, a prime minister or a first minister should be. And it's that authoritarian, I am always right, that, that I really find um, very difficult to accept. Um, I, I found it difficult to accept in my work life um, when, uh, you know, I, and that can be in clinical situations, man- management situations. Um, uh, I don't accept that and I will persist. I'm very, let's say, tenacious uh, when I come up, up against a problem like that. Um, and I've got a strong sense of what's right and wrong. Uh, sometimes it's maybe a bit too strong because I I feel I've got to pursue an argument, and um, you know I, I'm fortunate to have a team of people who have got the ability to pull me back sometimes and um, say, "Look, just hold on, let's let, let, let's just talk this out a bit," and that's a really valuable skill, um, uh, both from their point of view of knowing when to pull me back and have a chat, and also um, I would say that of myself, that's something I've learned that I really value, which is to, to broaden my, um, uh, I, I, I guess, broaden my audience to, out so that I'm listening to more people. It's not just the voice in my head that's important. It's really important to get the views of others. So this is sort of a question where it's not really relevant, but I want to ask it just for me. Uh, so th- this is like not a, a, a super strong opinion that I hold. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on it because you've got quite an interesting, unique perspective on this, considering how you were elected. But I, yep. because I'm not a huge fan of party politics, I would uh, always assume that if I was elected uh, within a party to be an MSP or an MP or whatever, and then I switch parties, I would feel obligated to then call a by-election. That would, that would be my personal thing because I don't see uh, myself as the person that was elected. I see the party as being elected. Uh, but you're in a quite a unique position to where you both technically were elected with SNP on your uh, next to your name, but also technically not as an SNP MP. So how do you see that situation? Um, well, at the end of the day, um, legally, it's the person that is elected. But I, I get the I get the concern. You know, I, I absolutely do. I think it comes down fundamentally to, um, uh, you know, what what do I believe that I was elected to represent? And so, even though the party and um, the true support, and you know, and to the extent that on election night. Uh, Peter Murrow phoned Steve Grimmond at Fife Council to warn him not to use the SNP when he was announcing the results. Of course, he didn't know the, the result at that time, but un, under no circumstance was he allowed to say SNP or Scottish National Party against my name. And I just kind of shrugged my shoulders and I thought, well, it's a bit petty, but you know, I'm just like, Steve, whatever suits you, Steve, I'm, I'm yeah. relaxed about it. Um, but, you know, I don't think anybody was in any confusion. Certainly, anybody who's paying attention uh, was in any confusion about what was happening in Kirkcaldy. Um, it was on. The, it's probably one of the biggest stories of that general election, and not just locally but nationally. Yeah. Um, it was a really, uh, still looking back, and it was a, 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 a really strange time. Um, and I had tremendous support across the political spectrum. So. Any notion that, you know, it was SNP members that got me elected is completely false. Um, you know, there were some SNP members who, you know, particularly George Kay, who took a very brave stance and a very vocal stance, and I will be forever grateful to George. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't think it's any secret about being really angry with me about the decision that I took. But, um, you know, there was, there was two real drivers um, for the decision that I took, and I've kind of hinted at them. First one was the way that I and others were being treated within the party 
um, uh, what, the hostility that was being uh, regularly dished out, the um, passive aggressive stuff being ignored uh, uh, and um, being treated differently uh, from other members uh, in a really hostile way and pulled through the media as a result. Um, but also that there's no appetite. Uh, I was elected to win independence for Scotland. I'm not confused about that at all. And everybody there is, um, you know, playing the Westminster game, worrying about what Jacob is saying. You know, I mean, I don't call him Jacob. He's, he's Jacob is mug and he's, you know, he's part of the problem. He's not somebody that I really want to associate myself with. So, you know, and so the fundamental reason was um, I wanted to get in, uh, independence right to the top of the agenda again. And I think the Alba Party have definitely achieved that. Whatever happens in this election, people know that there's an urgency. I hope that people back us uh, on the list to make that urgency really well pronounced because I have no confidence that um, the SNP will even attempt to hold an independence referendum in the next five years. I, I just don't believe it. We need members in that parliament who are going to push people like me who are you know, I am determined to see independence. Um, it's the right future. It's the only way for us to recover from the pandemic and from Brexit to get back out, you know, to get our economy back up and running. And we can answer all of the questions about Europe once that happens. But we must get independence because if we don't, you know, Scotland will be extinguished. Its identity will be rubbed out. We know that they're trying to do that already. How many, Stephen, how many MPs or ex-MPs have you interviewed? Is it just the one? I think it's just Roger Mullen, right? Uh, um, yes. Sorry, say that again? I, was, I, was, I, was, ask, I was asking how many MPs or ex-MPs we've interviewed. And I think it's just the one. I think it's just Roger Mullen. All right. Yeah. And uh, right. this is a question that I never asked. I never asked him, I don't think, because I never had... I, I wasn't quite as brazen back then. But I'm going to ask it now. You've grown up. How how do you sit across from somebody like Jacob rees and not just call him a bell end? Like, how are you able to hold back? He freaks me out, the guy. He I, freaks me out. I, I generally don't. I mean, you don't really see it all. Uh, particularly with Douglas Ross when he was um, Shadow Secretary of State. I mean, he just he wouldn't give way. He just kept talking. I mean, the man was just impossible. And, you know, what the, the cameras won't show is almost every single member on the Scottish bench is standing up and, and, and asking him to give way because he just talks Scotland down all the time. I mean, it really is. It, and it's the sneering and jeering. Uh, and sadly, you know, um, sometimes the, the speaker allows that behaviour to continue and that's disappointing. But it's not my parliament. It's not, that, it's not where I want to be. I'm very clear in my mind that it's, you know, I, I feel like an intruder there because I don't really want to be there um, and uh, I wish that every uh, Scottish member felt the same way mm. uh, but I know that some of them you know are quite comfortable with another five years and another five years I don't want another five years I want to be the last MP for Kakori that's what I want to be that's well, my ambition I don't want it to be any further than the end of this parliamentary term not because I'm, I like conspiracy theories but just because it seems logical that, it's a, I mean, it's a, that's not mince words, it's a pretty good paycheck you get being an MP. You get nice expenses, you've got people working for you. It's a, mm. I don't think it's a fun job, I think it sounds like the worst job in the world. It seems hard. But uh, it's a pretty good pay, and if you're already used to doing that job, I don't see that there's much reason to want to stop having that job. I think it's pretty safe, it's pretty secure, mm. and I don't see why some people would argue to stop that happening for themselves. Which is why I think also Nigel Farage was a bit a liar. I don't think he actually wanted to leave the EU. I think he wanted to pretend to be uh, the alternative because I think he quite liked the MP, the, the MEP expenses. I think he quite liked the salary as well. Mm -hmm. And I worry that that is starting to happen. I'm not saying it is happening because I'm unbiased. Do you, think but, they've, do you think they've been in long enough that that, that, that might start happening? I think so. Oh, I, th I mean, I think there are some folk who, some folk, some Scottish MPs who are quite happy there. 
mm. quite happy with their, their flat in London and, you know, and all that. But what I would say is that, you know, there's a real mis, uh, uh, misunderstanding around MPs' expenses. So, you know, I mean, when you say I get expenses, I don't get expenses for anything. I, you know, I, I, I get expenses for my travel to and from the Parliament and I get my accommodation paid. I don't get any food. You know, so there's there's no breakfasts or dinners or anything like that unless you meet certain uh, quite tight um, uh, guidelines. The staff, the office staff, if they come down to London to support me, they they get subsistence, which makes it only fair. Um, and um, you know, and I wouldn't be able to do my job if I didn't have staff who were paid for. It's just the, the peculiarity of how they organise um, uh, support for MPs is that you're given a budget. Uh, and you are effectively the employer, you employ the members of staff. But in terms of that, you know, £200,000 in expenses, I, I, I can't remember my figure off the top of my head, but at least one I saw the other day in, the, in a headline. And I was thinking, that, but that is, that's not money in anybody's pocket. That is office costs, staff costs, and all of that is, you know, hopefully, if you've got a decent MP, is geared towards solving problems for constituents. And I, you know, I cannot stress enough how valuable my team in the office are to constituents across the Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beef. We work really, really hard to do a good job for constituents. We have had well over 4,000 um, individual cases in the past year or so, and as some of them have been incredibly complex, incredibly challenging. Um, staff are dealing with people who are suicidal, people who have um, lost everything through the pandemic, people who have lost loved ones. And so they have a, they have, a, have to have a huge range of skills to be able to, to manage that and to liaise with me and to, you know, we meet regularly and go through some of the really tough cases, really hard things, uh, social work and um, children's placements and safety. You know, it's, uh, it's no picnic. Um, and I'm not, I'm not getting my wee violin or anything out. You know, we are well paid. Uh, that is absolutely true. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not complaining. But that's why if I'm elected for the Scottish Parliament, I'll take absolutely no additional money. Uh, you only get a third of the salary if you've already got a parliamentary place anyway, so you don't get the full um, salary. But all of that will go to uh, a, a trust fund and, uh, and be invested in local um, groups and uh, charities. Um, hopefully, you know, some of the inquiries we get in the office are from charities who are, who have run short of money because of the pandemic. And if I'm able to generate, generate a wee pot of cash and maybe get some tax back from the tax man to keep it going as well, then I'll be able to support some small charities and keep, um, those lifelines for so many people going. Mm -hmm. So, so you're keeping both jobs in? Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I, I I don't see that as an impediment at all. I mean, I'm keeping. I'll do. I can do the work with the the staff support from that I will have from each, each parliament. I can definitely do the work across both parliaments. And there's a real advantage if we are going to achieve independence in the very near future. Then there's a real advantage to have MSPs who have uh, that dual mandate and are able to access all of the services in Westminster be able to ask questions formally in Westminster as members of that parliament. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm seeking a dual mandate. It's to make that um, transition uh, from uh, the UK to an independent country uh, run more smoothly. I, I personally think that most of the SNP cohort and certainly the, the, the ones who had portfolios to lead should have been running for dual mandates in this election because it was a statement of intent. There's a statement, we are not staying in Westminster, we're going to Scotland where our decisions matter. Um, and I think it's all, you know, we've got to show our intention is not to be in Westminster. I don't want to be there, you know. So in terms of your question about folk wanting to get out of their job, you know, I am, uh, you know, I am determined to get out of that job as swiftly as possible. I did not go down there, you know, that the settle down, settle up statement. I mean, it, I, it's real with me. I want out of there. I don't want to be there. It's not our parliament.
Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was just, just sort of confirm between each other to see who's going to ask the next we've, question. We've got it in with secret language. Oh, you're all right. <laughs> well, well, I keep thinking of, I've, maybe said, I've maybe said something and you're going, oh, 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 that's us <laughs> conferring. This seems a bit like Harry Hill sometimes. Like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. It's weird. So that's us having a, <laughs> an in-depth conversation. That's the academic intellect of the two of us is, is unreal. It's beautiful, eh? Uh, so let's speak a bit candidly. In 2019, it was the election that you were kicked out of the SNP, right? Is that right? 2019? Yes, December yeah. 2019. So at that point, that was for anti-Semitism allegations. I'm not going to go into my views on this. You know my views on this. Uh, yeah. But afterwards, there's been some changes in your views on Palestine. Have those views changed again, or are you pretty much the same place as you were when you got back into the SNP? No, I, I would I would disagree with you, there, uh, with you, Craig. My my views on Palestine haven't changed uh, at all. What I would say is that I've had, and I genuinely mean this, I've, had, I've been really fortunate in that um, after after all of that happened and I got down to Westminster, I reached out to some key people because I wanted to, you know, I, there was a real kind of, well, we don't think it's anti-Semitic and, and, you know, and I was left pondering and thinking, well, you know, I accepted it was at the time. I needed to understand it so that I could really differentiate between what was anti-Semitic and what wasn't. And so Andrew Percy, who's an MP, was speaking in the Holocaust Memorial um, debate, and um, he spoke really passionately, and he mentioned MPs that had been criticised for anti-Semitic stuff during the campaign. And he looked at me while he was saying it, and I looked at him, and you know, and I, I, I walked across the chamber and said, look, I'd really like to have a chat with you sometime about this. I know I'm not anti-Semitic, but I need to understand how what I said would be um, offensive, and and so we had a really nice chat. He put me in touch with Danny Stone from the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust, and Danny and I had a, a couple of meetings. He's a, a really nice guy as well. But these are ordinary people; they're not, you know, they're, they're, there's nothing mysterious about it. And um, I did the Yad Vashem uh, course, which was really fascinating. And um, you know, throughout those conversations, neither Andrew. Uh, uh, nor um, Danny have argued with me about my views on the Palestinian crisis or my concerns about the humanitarian issues. I, you know, to, to sum it all up, what I would say is that what it has taught me is why would I want to offend the very people that I need to engage with to make this crisis stop? And 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 that's really where I'm coming from now. So um, there's a softening in my language, and I I, I totally accept that. But that doesn't mean, you know, that I am not I, I am not as concerned as I was before. I'm not as appalled as I was before about some of the atrocities that I've witnessed by the idea. That all stands, and I have signed um, parliamentary letters in that regard uh, on a number of times, uh, as well as EDMs uh, on the Palestinian situation. Uh, I still am um, absolutely clear about a two-state, two-state solution. I think the annexation idea is absolutely abhorrent. Um, so, no, I mean, my views have not changed. What I won't do is um, use language that, and this is the important point, that is potentially going to offend Jewish people who share the same political views as me about the solution to Palestine. And so it's that reason, and that was a really important uh, um, point that was made to me when I had a discussion with uh, Danielle from the Jewish Leadership Council in Scotland, was that, you know, there are lots of people who find invoking um, things like the Holocaust uh, or the Nazi party in, in, in reference to them, that they find that deeply hurtful. And not because of any anything other than it's a really painful period in their culture's history. And so um, I, what, what's changed for me is I now choose not to invoke something that I know will be offensive to people who share my passion for a humanitarian uh, uh, solution to the current crisis. So uh, I hope that comes across clearly. It really is, you know, I know that I've read quite a few prominent people saying that I've been brainwashed 
Uh, I, I mean, that's just not true. Uh, you know, the, the the course that I did is completely available to the public. It's fascinating, um, and it uh, and it's really helpful. There's some really interesting bits in there about the historical relationship uh, in historical relationships in the Middle East between uh, people with Jewish faith and uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, the Islam uh, as well. And um, it really is only a Funnily enough, a, a British, almost a British invention of the conflict uh, from the Balfour uh, uh, Declaration time. So, you know, our Balfour Treaty. So, um, it it was a really interesting piece of um, uh, learning, and so I think that that that, that really kind of said it all. I think Does that makes sense to you. Yeah, that makes sense. So the re- <laughs> the only reason I brought it up is because I noticed that the Fife branch of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign uh, yeah. are, uh, what's the word, incessant. It's, it's, a, it's a constant, pretty much everyday thing where they'll tag you. Yes, no, no. So, so that was the reason I brought up. I, I mean, and, and I kind of get it because, you know, I, but I'm not going to name check anybody because uh, it's not going to fair if they're not here to respond. But you know, uh, there were folk folk uh, who gave me their absolutely outstanding support during my campaign, and because of the pandemic, we've not been able to get together, and hopefully, we will very soon to have that very conversation that we've just had. And 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 there's a, a really valuable piece of learning in that. I, I hope I'm able to get across. Um, and it's not, you know, I understand there's a mis- misinterpretation of the situation and that, that's probably the best way to put it. But m- my concerns are undiminished and, you know, and I haven't had to apologise for those concerns to anybody. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. You know, it's very clear that there are not just people in the, the, the organisations I've mentioned, but certainly through my parliamentary work, um, uh, uh, I've been engaged with people from Israel who um, share many of my concerns and are striving to find a solution to the humanitarian crisis. And some of the, you know, absolute outrages that are visited upon uh, Palestinian people, and we'll just continue to do that. But I will do that in a way that I don't introduce a, a, a position of conflict that diverts my area of concern uh, uh, away from the humanitarian issue. It doesn't help anyone if we start arguing about name calling in the midst of important issues such as that. So this is the, sort of my final, more contentious uh, questioning. Uh, the rest of the interview, I don't know how long we're going to be going on for, but the rest of it will be pretty plain sailing. I've got to be in Stirling at four o'clock, so you've got ten minutes. All right, oh. okay. Uh, just quickly then. This Margaret Lynch situation, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Because it doesn't look very good from where I'm sitting. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't look very good, but they, the way of, what about the, of it is, is really the problem. And so Margaret highlighted something that exists in a document. Um, it's a factual statement that the um, ILGA document does say that, I can't remember the exact words verbatim, but that there should be decriminalisation of um, uh, some of the uh, uh, sexual activity of adolescents. Now, it doesn't specify that that is lower than the age of consent, 10, but the standard definition, and this is my clinical background, is in adolescent cancer. So it's quite right in that 10 to 19-year-old analysis that that's a, a reasonably accurate um, age range. And the question is not really what does it contain. It's how would such a document be um, uh, uh, used in a legal situation? What do the definitions really mean? And those words are important. I know that some people say, "Oh, well, it doesn't really matter. It's not. It's not specific." Well, it does really matter because law has to be specific, and um, otherwise, the interpretation is open to the kinds of definitions that Margaret's alluding to. So. It, um, what happened after that was that everybody said you're accusing gay men of being pedophiles and clearly that was not 
a statement or a comment that she made, and it's certainly not something that she believes because I know Margaret, and um, and she's been uh, an ally, ally to the LGBT movement uh, throughout her years, um, and and to me, so uh, I, I just think it's um, it, it's the what what about her that's made that connection rather than her? Does that make sense? And so it's been the oh you've said that. Um, gay men are paedophiles and of course she didn't say that at all um, and nobody in the Alba party believes that least of all me um, my view is very clear you, there's no such thing as a straight, lesbian, gay, bisexual transgender, paedophile there are paedophiles and there are gay, straight lesbian, bisexual, transgender people um, it, it has nothing to do with sexuality it's, a, um, it, it's about control and abuse, and uh, it should not be associated with um, uh, LGBT or straight um, identities at all. It's a completely separate thing. The concern is, and this is historical, so from the 70s, um, when uh, the Pedophile Information Exchange, PI, yeah. tried to um, attach itself to the lesbian gay movement, uh, then in the 90s we had NAMBLA, which again was an American um Men Boys Love Association, something like that. Again, tried to associate itself with the LGBT movement. And we've now got um, the uh, trans rights activists who um, I, I am appalled by the behaviour uh, as they try to advance their case. I mean, could you imagine if we tried to fight for independence with the same kind of tactic of shouting people down, trying to get them fired from their jobs if they didn't agree with us? I mean, it's an absolutely atrocious way to behave in any political context. Um, but, you know, the people that I see um, mount, mounting these attacks generally tend to be um, young men against women. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of transgender people behaving in that way. In fact, I know quite a lot of transgender people who um, are uh, extremely concerned about the impact of that behaviour on their lives um, you know, pe pe very brave people like Debbie Hayton, who I'm in touch with uh, a, a lot, who speaks out as a trans woman against this, these kind of tactics. And she is absolutely pilloried and attacked in exactly the same way as um, uh, women who stand up for their sex based rights. And it really has to stop. Uh, there's no place for that. You know, I, I, I was in, you know, five years when I was a counsellor, and we had. You know the, the the annual debate, if you like, about the white ribbon campaign and how domestic violence had to be stamped out and balanced against women, blah blah blah, all of that misogynistic stuff. And nobody would have objected to that. No one at all. No one in the room because you just wouldn't. And it now feels like it's open season on any women who uh, somebody decides is transphobic. And of course, most of them, the last thing in the world they are is transphobic. I mean. It, it's really painful to be called transphobic. I mean, I, you know, I've led five, five years in a row. I've got friends who are trans. And, you know, and I think a trans identity is such a courageous uh, um, decision to take and, and to be to, 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 to so brave to be yourself in such a profound way. Um, you know, I've got you know, absolute respect. And what I don't like is um, young straight men calling me a homophobe because I'm a, I care about the safety of children and women. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know? Uh, and I've had some pretty horrific abuse. Pretty horrific. Uh, so, and of course, none of it's accurate at all. I mean, the last thing I am is phobic about anything. Yeah. So, apologies, I did not realise the time I expected us to have only been on about 35 minutes, 40 minutes maybe, <laughs> and it, we went on for an hour. So I thought there was uh, going to be a... I didn't expect to end on those questions. I expected to go into something a bit more upbeat yeah. Yeah, afterwards, but that was my well, fault. Give, I didn't realise. I'll, I'll, I'll give you something. Ask me an upbeat question, then I'll finish it on an upbeat. Well, actually, we'll, uh, we have a, a particular ending. If we just go into that now, yeah. this is the way we use the end of the podcast. Um, so right, through, okay. through the years... We've been to like different hustings and different. We've seen like uh, politicians and different radio radio shows when they're given two or three minutes to sort of cover things such as 
uh, worldwide terrorism, solve it in three minutes. Yeah. Those kind of like really annoying, stupid things. But I do like the idea. Um, I can't like like I, I do I do like to see the politicians challenged in this sense a few times. So I'm going to ask, and I'm going to uh, start a timer. We'll give you two minutes, Neil, to tell the people why <laughs> yeah. to vote for you. Three, two, one, go. If you believe that Scotland can be uh, what you imagine it can be, a prosperous, caring uh, country where we look after each other the way that we would like to be looked after, then the only way to achieve that is to step away from pernicious Tory policies. The only way to achieve that is to take control of our own future and to maximise the wealth and benefits that we have as a country for our own people. Uh, It's not selfish. It's just being responsible. Being responsible for yourself, for your family and for your community. So I would ask you to vote for me, for Alba, so that we can start that journey as a country and we can take control and have a much better, much more prosperous and caring future. There you go. We'll take that. That was 48 seconds. Amazing. Um, so, uh, thank you, Neil, for joining us. It's been much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. That was uh, fun.